Okay, last night we talked about a guy, and actually the wrong name is up there. The guy we talked about last night was who? Isaac and Ishmael. Okay, so Isaac was, uh, he was born into what we could describe as a dysfunctional family, and Isaac's family turned out to be, guess what? Dysfunctional. Okay? So he had two sons, Jacob and Esau. Okay? Now these two sons could not have been more different. They were twins. But Esau was born first. And in that culture, in that society, the order of birth was critical. Okay? The firstborn son became kind of the head of the tribe, head of the clan. Okay? So, so Esau was born first, and Jacob was born second. But even at the very beginning, the story tells us that Jacob came out clinging to Esau's ankle that these two were at each other from the start, okay? And what we also find out is that to add to the dysfunctional family, Jacob, he was a nice mama's boy. He liked to stay at home. Esau was a rugged hunter. So these two were completely different people. And one day, Esau comes back, and he is starving. He's famished, and Jacob is cooking. And Esau says, give me something to eat. And Jacob says, give me your birthright. In other words, give me the right of being the firstborn in this family, and I'll give you something to eat. To his own brother. To his own brother, who was hungry, he bargained for food. And Esau goes along with it and says, okay, look, you can have my birthright because I'm going to die if I don't eat. Some years go by, and Isaac is now old. And as he is getting ready to pass on to the next world, he says to Esau, still the older son, even though I gave up the birthright, come, and I will give you my blessing. It is time for me to depart. Okay? Now, Esau says, very well. Esau goes out, and he hunts, and he finds some food to prepare a feast so he can receive his father's blessing. And in the meantime... Their mom gets involved. And their mom decides she doesn't want Esau to have the blessing. She wants Jacob to have the blessing. How dysfunctional. You've got a mom trying to screw over her own kid. Okay. And sure enough, it works. She dresses him up in hair and makes him smell like Esau because the problem was that their father Isaac couldn't see very well. And he goes in, and here's Isaac all dressed up in hair and looking like a fool, but his dad can't tell. His dad's confused, asks questions, are, are you really my older son? Yes, I'm your, I'm your older son. And gives him the blessing to the younger son. So on top of stealing the birthright, he then steals the blessing. Okay? Now, what do you think, remember what I told you about Esau? Remember what I told you about Jacob? What do you think Esau was getting ready to do when he, find out, when he finds out what happens. What? Angry. angry. And remember, one is a rugged hunter, the other one's a nice stay-at-home kind of guy. What do you think he wanted to do? He wanted to kill him. True story. Esau was furious at Jacob because his father had blessed him. And Esau said to himself, when the period of mourning for the death of my father is over, I will kill my brother. In other words, when we walk home from the funeral that day, I'm going to end him. Rebecca was told what her older son Esau was planning, so she summoned her younger son Jacob and said to him, Esau, your brother is planning revenge. He plans to kill you. So now, my son, listen to me. Get up and escape to my brother Laban in Haran. Live with him for a short while until your brother's rage subsides until your brother's anger at you goes away and he forgets what you did to him. Okay, stop. Is there anything that makes you think he's ever going to forget what his younger brother did? Absolutely not. Then I will send for you and bring you back from there. Why should I suffer the loss of both of you on one day? Okay? So, Jacob does what he is told. Okay? And off he goes. Now, years go by, 
And he goes off, and his uncle Laban, turns out dysfunction runs through the whole family. There's all kinds of drama and dysfunction and trickery goes on there. And finally, he decides, Jacob decides, look, I want to come home. Like, I'm tired of living with Uncle Laban. I want to come home. But I got to know what's going to happen when I get there. Okay? So he decides to send some messengers to find out how this is going to go down. This is years later. Jacob sent messengers ahead of him to his brother Esau to the land of Seir, the open country of Edom. He gave these orders. Say to my master Esau, this is the message of your servant Jacob. Stop right there. Master? He stole the birthright. He stole the blessing. But all of a sudden, he's calling a master and calling himself servant. I've lived as an immigrant with Laban, where I've stayed till now. I own cattle, donkeys, flocks, men servants, and women servants. I'm sending this message to my master uh, now to ask that he be kind. Right? He's explaining to him, look, I've got stuff. I'm not coming to get your stuff. I don't want anything you have. I've got my own stuff. I just want to come home. Message returned to Jacob <laughs> and said, we went out to your brother Esau, and he is coming to meet you with 400 men. 400 men. And this is the proper translation. Jacob was terrified and felt trapped. He wet himself. Okay? I don't know if he actually did, but can you imagine? Yeah, he's coming with 400 men. Why on earth would you need 400 men to welcome your brother, unless you're going to kill everyone. Jacob was terrified and felt trapped, so he divided the people with him and the flocks and the cattle and the camels into two camps. He thought, if Esau meets the first camp and attacks it, at least one camp will be left to escape. He is fully planning for this to get ugly, really ugly. Jacob said, listen to this prayer, Lord, God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, who said, Go back to your country and your relatives, and I will make sure things go well for you. I don't deserve, I don't deserve how loyal and truthful you've been to your servant. What does that sound like? Which day of the week? What's he acknowledging? What's he saying? He screwed up, right? He screwed up. I don't deserve how loyal and truthful you've been to your servant. I went away across the Jordan with just my staff, but now I've become two camps. Save me from my brother Esau. I'm afraid he'll come and kill me, the mothers and their children. You are the one who told me I will make sure, make sure things go well for you, and I will make your descendants like the sand of the sea, so you won't be able to count them. Right? So in his desperation to not get killed and not get his whole family wiped out, he prays. He owns up. He says, look, I messed up, but I need your help. Okay? God hears his prayers. Jacob spent the night there. From what he had acquired, he set aside a gift for his brother Esau. 200 female goats and 20 male goats, 200 ewes and 20 rams, 30 nursing camels and young, 40 cows and 10 bulls and 20 female donkeys and 10 male donkeys. He separated these herds and gave them to his servants. He said to them, go ahead of me and put some distance between each of the herds. He ordered the first group, when my brother Esau meets you and asks you, who are you with, where are you going, and whose herds are those in front of you, say, they are your servants Jacob, a gift sent to my master Esau, and Jacob is actually right behind us. He ordered the second group, the third group, and everyone following the herds, say exactly the same thing to Esau when you find him. Say also, your servant Jacob is right behind us. Jacob thought, I may be able to pacify Esau with the gift I'm sending ahead, and when I meet him, perhaps he will be kind to me. So Jacob sent the gift ahead of him, but spent the night in the camp. Give me a word for how Jacob is feeling. Desperate? What else? Hmm? Scared? Terrified? Right? He, he is anticipating that this will not go well for him. Jacob looked up. And saw Esau approaching with his 400 men. Jacob divided the children among Leah, Rachel, and the other two women servants. He put the servants and their children first, Leah and her children after them, and Rachel and Joseph last. He himself went in front of them and bowed to the ground seven times as he was approaching his brother. But Esau 
ran to meet him, threw his arms around his neck, kissed him, and they wept. Plot twist. Plot twist. Esau looked up and saw the women and the children and said, Who are these with you? Jacob said, The children that God has graciously gave your servant. The, wo the woman servants and their children came forward and bowed down. Then Leah and her servants also came forward and bowed down. And afterwards, Joseph and Rachel came forward and bowed down. And Esau said, What's the meaning of this entire group of animals that I met? Jacob said, to ask for my master's kindness. Esau says, I already have plenty, my brother. Keep what's yours. This is the little punk that screwed him out of everything he was owed. And yet, years later, when they meet, Esau acts like nothing ever happened. Jacob said, no, please, do me the kindness of accepting my gift. Seeing your face is like seeing God's face, since you've accepted me so warmly. Take this present that I've bought because God has been generous to me and I have everything I need. So Jacob persuaded him and he took it. Friends, the word of the Lord. What comes to your mind when you think about forgiveness? What do we most often think about when we think about forgiveness? Most often, in the church, we think about us being forgiven, right? The, the prayer confession, the declaration of pardon, Jesus died on the cross for our sins, that type of forgiveness. And we talked about that type of forgiveness, didn't we? We talked about that type of forgiveness on Tuesday. The forgiveness we need when we have screwed up. But here's what I'm going to tell you. Tonight, we're not talking about you being forgiven. We're talking about you forgiving. And I'm going to be really honest with you. I know some miserable adults. And there is a common thread to every miserable adult I know. They can't forgive. They can't forgive. I have never, ever sat with a couple whose marriage was struggling and they have said to me, you know, the one thing we do really well, we're really good at forgiving one another. Right? Ne ne never, never happened. Never happened. I have never in my life stood at a funeral and had somebody say, you know what made this guy a jerk? He forgave too much. Never. Never, ever happened. Forgiveness. Forgiveness is a conscious process of letting go of our claims against others for how they have wronged us. Forgiveness is a conscious process of letting go of our claims against others for how they have wronged us. And let me tell you a, a somewhat comical story now. It was not funny at the time, but it illustrates this. When my wife and I bought our first house, we painted it. And we painted it turquoise. I mean, this was turquoise. And she had the idea to paint a brown accent wall. So we got the paint. And the problem was the main paint store we went to was closed. So we had to go to another paint store. Paint turned out to be junk. So now we had a messy brown wall that looked basically like, well, fill in the blank what it looked like. Yeah, it wasn't chocolate. So I thought this was kind of funny. I thought this was kind of funny. And a couple times over the next day or two, I said, yeah, like the brown wall. right? Referring to kind of joking, trying to pick on her about this idea. I'll never forget, I made a snide brown wall comment, and she turned to me, and she said, you can't make fun of me for that anymore. Right? She basically said, you need to get over that. You need to get over the fact that you had to paint a wall twice because I made a bad call. Too bad. Let it go. That is what it means to forgive. Is to say, you can't bring this up anymore. When you forgive, you don't get to go to somebody and say, hey, but do you remember that time that you did this? 
Forgiveness says, uh, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to hold it against you anymore. I'm not going to bring it up. I did some reading on forgiveness. And what's fascinating about forgiveness is that it is not just a Christian concept. In psychology, it's a very popular concept. And in Greater Good Magazine, which is put out by the University of California at Berkeley, so this is not quacks and idiots, these are real people with real knowledge, write this about forgiveness. Psychologists generally define forgiveness as a conscious, deliberate decision to release feelings of resentment or vengeance toward a person or group who's harmed you, regardless of whether they actually deserve your forgiveness. This is not a church article. This is a, a secular, socially researched journal that writes that forgiveness, whether the person deserves it or not, that's what forgiveness is. It's, it's letting go of those feelings of resentment. Just as important as defining what forgiveness is, and this is where I want you to follow really closely, though, is understanding what forgiveness is not. Experts who study and teach forgiveness make clear that when you forgive, you do not gloss over or deny the seriousness of an offense against you. Forgiveness does not mean forgetting, nor does it mean condoning or excusing offenses. Though forgiveness can help repair damaged relations, it doesn't obligate you to reconcile with the person who harmed you or to release them from legal accountability. So this isn't, forgiveness is not saying to somebody, it's no big deal when it is a big deal. Forgiveness is not saying to somebody, you know, it's okay that you drove your car drunk and ran it into my car and caused a whole bunch of damage. I'm not going to worry about that. That's not what forgiveness is. This is what forgiveness, and again, secular definition, but it's amazing how close it lines up. Instead, forgiveness brings the forgiver peace of mind and frees them from corrosive anger. While there's some debate over whether true forgiveness requires positive feelings toward the offender, experts agree that it at least involves letting go of deeply held negative feelings. In that way, it empowers you to recognize the pain you suffered without letting that pain define you, enabling you to heal and move on with your life. Forgiveness is not saying no big deal. Forgiveness is not saying, you know, You've hurt me a lot, but I guess I have to forgive you, so we're going to be friends again, or we're going to date again, or I'm still going to live here again. Right? It's not that. It's specifically letting go of this corrosive anger. So why don't people forgive? I mean, look, everyone agrees. Psychologists agree. Everyone agrees. Forgiving, learning to forgive, the act of forgiveness is good for you. It is. It's good for you. Just not even research. I can tell you that people who forgive are happier people. And people who hold grudges are miserable to be around. So why don't they forgive? I think there's two reasons. Holding onto grudges and hurts is a painful comfort. Ever thought of something that could be painful and comfortable at the same time? Sometimes the pains and the hurts that we deal with, that we carry, that we have suffered, they become so familiar to us, they become so part of who we are, that the idea of not having them is painful. Letting go is painful. Add to that this. It's costly because we give something up. It's costly because we have to give up a claim. We have to give up a resentment. We have to give up being able to throw back in somebody's face what they did to us. It costs us something. And it's painful. Because it's a letting go of what we've experienced in pain. But what's the cost of not forgiving? Well, not forgiving is this. Failing to forgive is like drinking poison and hoping the other person's going to die. Failing to forgive is like drinking a poison yourself, taking it in, and then hoping the other person will die. Here's the thing. Last night, uh, some of you had a little, a, a little bit of a reaction last night to what I said. And I know, I know for a lot of you, what I stirred up last night, what I talked about, was real, and it was painful, 
And it's not a joke. It's not funny. It's not just someone stole your milk money. There are real deep woundedness amongst you. And for so many of you, it's, it's not your fault. It's not your fault. We talked about the screw-ups. I'm not, I'm not talking about the screw-ups. But here's the thing I want to tell you. Failing to forgive is like drinking poison, hoping the other person dies, not you. So how do you forgive? I mean, how... How, how do you forgive? And to be honest, this is where the, the psychology begins to break down. This is where, as I read, psychologists begin to run out of answers. And this is why psychologists debate whether or not you have to have positive feelings toward the person or not to, in order to forgive them. Because this is where we run into a wall. How can you forgive? If these feelings are so real and so painful, how can you forgive someone who's wronged you and hurt you in a very deep, powerful, and life-impacting way? Well, C.S. Lewis, who wrote the Chronicles of Narnia, wrote this. To be Christian means to forgive the inexcusable because God has forgiven the inexcusable in you. And this is my favorite line that C.S. Lewis wrote. This is hard. Thanks. Like we didn't know that. But I want to point you to the two examples we looked at tonight. The father in the story of the prodigal son and Esau both choose to respond with grace despite being wronged and taken advantage of. Make no mistake about it. That younger son embarrassed his father. He humiliated his father. In order to satisfy the younger son's request, the older father, the father would have had to sell half of his property. What an embarrassment in the town. That out of all that, he had to give up half because his son was being a jerk. He humiliated his father. And yet, the father in the story responds with grace and forgiveness and mercy, and says, welcome home, son. Welcome home. Esau, in the same way, was cheated, was mistreated, and in the midst of all that, when his, when his brother comes back, he chooses to respond with grace. And here's the thing is, nobody, no one would, would have questioned Esau if he had killed Jacob on the spot. But he chose not to. He chose to forgive. He chose the way of grace. He said, no, look, keep your stuff. It's cool. We're cool. It's good. Jacob knew what had happened, but Esau said, look, I'm not, I'm not going to beat you up about that. Lewis continues, how can we do it? How can we forgive? Only, I think, by remembering where each of us stand, by meaning our words when we say in our prayers each night, Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Or forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Or forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. You see, we are offered forgiveness on no other terms. To refuse it is to refuse God's mercy for ourselves. In other words, to refuse to forgive, in a way, refuses God's mercy for ourselves. And here's the thing. There's no hint of exceptions, and God means what he says. In other words, Lewis writes in strong language, we have an obligation to forgive. We don't have an obligation to forget. We don't have an obligation to overlook it. We don't have an obligation to do anything else but forgive. And why is that? Forgiving others, as costly as it may be, frees us from the toxic wounds that infect us. Here's an analogy, and this is gross. How many of you have, have ever gotten a cut? All right. Now, when you get a cut, normally what happens is you get a cut and you go get a Band-Aid and you put Neosporin on it, right, or some triple antibiotic or something to keep it from getting infected. Because what happens if a cut gets infected? It gets nasty. It gets nasty, right? 
it gets nasty. Look, we all get cuts. We all know how we have to deal with those cuts. Here's the analogy I want you to think about. The pain and hurt in your life are those cuts. Right? Not literal, but they are cuts. They are wounds that you carry in your person, in your being, and who you are. Now, you have a choice. You have a choice to either put some Neosporin on it and put a Band-Aid on it, or let it get infected. Let it become toxic. Right? The pain and hurt that you deal with in your life, you have a choice, a hard one, to either forgive or to allow that wound to fester and to grow and to get infected. This is not an easy choice. This is not an easy choice. I have known people who have had to deal with incredibly hard things. A member of my congregation that I served, his infant son passed away because the nurse who was caring for him came to work sick one day. A woman in the same congregation, was, her son was riding his bike and he drove out into the street and, he was, and was struck by another member of the same church and died. A dear, dear friend of mine watched as her husband over and over again cheated on her, left her, abandoned her, and then begged his way back. And the most amazing thing about the three people that I've just talked to you about is that these were people who found a way to forgive the inexcusable who found a way to forgive the inexcusable. Those are inexcusable situations. But they found a way to forgive. But here's where I want to caution you, because this sounds, even in my own mind, simple. It sounds too simple. Too easy. This is what I want you to understand. Forgiveness is, is a process. It's not an act. You don't forgive the hurts and pains like this, right? You don't forgive, you're like, oh! All that crap my dad did to me, I'm good. I came home from TYC. It's all forgiven. I'm fine. You don't forgive in an instant. You forgive as a process. This week, as I was talking with some of the staff, the same conversation kept happening. And people would say, you know, as soon as I think I'm over something, it comes up again. Like, I thought I was over what happened with such and such. But then this happened, and I got to think about it, and I got mad all over again. And you forgive again. You forgive again. Forgiveness is a process. It's not an act. It's not something that you do in a moment. And the thing is, that process can be long. Can be long. Years and years and years of forgiving and practicing forgiving. And there are so many different things that come into play. Oftentimes, I know from people who experience deep hurts, therapy, Spending time facing what has happened to them in a therapist's office has been a critical part of that. I want you to understand something very, very clearly. Right? Therapy is not for the weak. It's for the people who know they have a problem. Okay? Therapy is not for the weak. <laughs> All right? Therapy is for people who know that they have a problem that they need to deal with. All right? There's no shame in saying to your parents, I need to talk to somebody that's not you. There's no shame in that, right? At points in my life, I have had a monthly appointment with my therapist. And I've just said, you're going to sit there and I'm going to tell you what's going on in my life. And if you've got insights, great. Right? At points in my life, that has been critical in helping me get through challenges that I have faced. Right? There is no shame in therapy. Amen? Second thing, what did I say about trying to carry burdens alone? In the words of Tomater, to not to. Right? To not to. The times that I have dealt with hurt that was significant and painful, I have needed to talk through my forgiveness plan with someone else. 
I have needed to strategize with someone about what it was that I needed to do in order to forgive. There is absolutely no shame in saying to somebody, I am really ticked off at so-and-so. This is what they did, and I need you to help me forgive them. We seem to forget that like, as a Christian community, we do a lot of things together, and forgiving is one of those things. Forgiving is one of those things. So there's no shame in needing professional help in dealing with the challenges of life. There's no shame with saying to people, I need your help to forgive so-and-so. There's no shame in any of that. And the third thing, and there's a lot more to it, but, but these were kind of the big three. I do not want you to underestimate the power of prayer. It is very hard it is very hard to truly hate people you pray for regularly. It takes time. But one of my mentors in ministry said, I pray the most for my enemies, not my friends. I pray the most for my enemies, not my friends. Because when you pray for someone daily, it becomes harder and harder to resent them. And see, that's the goal of forgiveness. The goal of forgiveness is not to make the other person feel better. That's their problem, not yours. Right? You may have, an, have a situation in your life where someone has done wrong to you and you have zero interest in ever speaking to them again. That's fine. That's fine. I'm not saying that in forgiving, you have to go back to bad situations and bad people who have hurt you and done you wrong. Forgiveness doesn't even require you to talk to people if you don't want to. Forgiveness is about you and what goes on inside of you and the resentment and the anger and the hurt that you have. Not them. Reconciliation is a whole different topic that we're not talking about. Forgiveness is about dealing with what is inside of you. And that hurt, that anger, and that pain. And processing it, dealing with it, so that it does not define you. I almost didn't end on this story, but I'm going to. Because I think... It's hard. Like, this is, of all the nights, this is the hardest one for me to do for you. Hardest talk to give. Because this is not easy. This is challenging. It's demanding. But let me give you a little bit of warning. You see, in that two sons, in the story of the prodigal son, there's another son. The older son. The older son is, the, is to me, a warning against unforgiveness. Now his older son, father of son, was in the field. Coming in from the field, he approached the house and heard the music and dancing, right? The younger son was back. They were throwing a party. He called one of the servants and asked what was going on. And the servant replied, your brother has arrived. Your father has slaughtered the fattened calf because he received his son back safe and sound. Then the older son was furious and didn't want to enter in. But his father came out and begged him. He answered his father, Look, I've served you all these years and I've never disobeyed your instruction. Yet you've never given me as much as a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, right? Not my brother. Not my brother, he says. When this son of yours returned after gobbling up your estate on prostitutes, you slaughtered the fattened calf. You threw a party. Father said, son, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. I want you to read this line. Then the older son is furious and didn't want to enter in. The older son was so bitter. He was so resentful. He was so hurt. He was so angry about his knucklehead little brother and what he had done that he was willing to sit out a party to hold on to his bitterness, hurt, and resentment. Dang. <laughs> Every time. Now it's good. It's good. Are you sure? Yep, it's good. You're going to pick him up here in a minute anyway. Okay. He was willing to miss a party, a celebration. Joy. To close. As I said, I know people 
who have endured great pain and great hurt and great suffering in their life. And the ones that thrive are the ones who don't forget it happened, who don't learn lessons about themselves from the situations. They're not that, but they're people who have learned to forgive, who have learned to say, the hurt that I carry, the burdens and pains that I have, they will not define me. I will find a way to forgive those who have harmed me and done me wrong. The most bitter, miserable people I know are people who cling to hurts and pains of the past and will bring them up every time they have a chance. So, it is my prayer. It is my hope that for you, you learn to be people of forgiveness. Because I know for me, I have decided something. That at my funeral, when my day has come and I've journeyed home, if they say nothing else about me, if they say nothing else about who I was and what I did, and even the type of father and husband I was, if they say nothing else about any of that, I want someone to be able to say of me, you know what? He knew how to forgive. He knew how to forgive. You see, forgiveness so much is about what we allow our hurts and pains to do to us. It's not about the other person, but it's about us. And it's my hope that you, tonight, can reflect on some of what you're dealing with, no matter how small it may seem, and begin to think, are there things I need to forgive? Do I let this resentment build inside me? Do I, do I let this anger overwhelm me? Do I let it control me and define me? And what I would encourage and hope that you would be able to do this week is to start, not finish, but to start a process of forgiving someone, not everyone, forgiving someone who has done you wrong, who has hurt you. 